Welcome everyone to this Trust Challenge webinar. This is uh, the fifth digital media and learning competition uh, administered by Haystack and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. I'm Cheryl Grant. I'm social uh, director of social networking for the DML competition, and I'll be your host for the hour. And before I introduce my guests, I want to let people know that um, everyone can participate and ask questions. Demos Orfanides is producing today's webinar, and if you have any technical difficulties, you can email him at dmlcomp at haystack.org, or you can send your question directly to him using the webinar chat tool if you are in the webinar platform. If you are in the webinar platform and you're not just calling in by phone, you probably noticed that um, Connie Yowell is not with us at the moment, and uh, she's running late from, from another engagement, so we, we hope that she's going to be able to join us soon. And, um, and so let's, uh, let's just move ahead with our webinar and, and, and go ahead and, and have our conversations. And when Connie can, comes back in, we can, um, we can loop back around and, and ask some of the questions and, and find out how she would answer them. Um, if you have any questions for our guests, you can either post them to Twitter using the DML Trust hashtag, or you can add them to the questions chat box in the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, my colleague Casey Coleman will be keeping track of your questions and she'll be feeding them to, to me so I can ask our guests. And if you are having to drop out for some reason, can't, can't squeeze in the whole hour, we'll have a full video recording of this webinar available that we'll be putting up on dmlcompetition.net. Um, it's under the webinars page. There's a tab there for webinars. And you will see archived webinars from our summer collaboration. We did a, a four series summer collaboration with Connected Learning Alliance on building trust in connected learning environments. And um, we also put together a SoundCloud recording of our most recent, well, I guess not most recent at this point, but it was one of our webinars with Kathy Casserly, who is a fellow at the Aspen Institute, and David Thiel Goldberg, co-founder of Haystack. Um, it's a great resource if you are, are thinking of applying to the competition, which closes on Monday, November 3rd. Uh, it's a great resource that's annotated so you can click through easily to find questions and answers and um, that was put together by by jade davis it's a great resource for those of you who are getting ready to apply um, and i just want to remind everybody that we are we're really here to do two things today one is to explore some of the issues um, that have come up around this competition the trust challenge these um, these issues and this trust challenge are a response to the call to action that came out of the Aspen Task Force Learner at Learning and um, I'm sorry Learner at the Center of a Networked World report that came out um, in the summertime and it's a great resource again if you are thinking of applying or if you're just interested in this issue it's a great resource to try and ground yourself and get some intellectual framing for for your application. And we'll be sort of having those themes thread through our conversation today, as well as bridging this with, with connected learning. Um, so we invite you to ask our, our guest questions and, and, um, and add to the conversation as well if you have any comments. So I want to go ahead and introduce our guest. For those of you who have been following the, the competition for years and who know Haystack and, and know Kathy Davidson needs no introduction, um, she is now the director of the Futures Initiatives at CUNY. She has uh, um, made a, a big transition from Duke and is now based there and is doing some, some fascinating work um, and doing a lot of work with data and, and issues in society. So we're very excited to have her join us. Um, hi, Kathy. Hi. And we also have Jade. Great to be here. Great to be here. Hi, everyone. And I'll, I'll give both Kathy and, and Jade a little chance to say something about their, their work. Um, Jade Davis is also uh, part of our Haystack team. She is. Uh, uh, like me, she's a doctoral student. She's very invested and steeped in this work and um, is our program coordinator. And you've probably seen much of her work, um, the blog series that we have run about trust and, and trust in connected learning environments. Um, Jade has been doing that and blogging about um, all the issues that, that surround this topic. So welcome to both of you. Um, Kathy, do you want to start off by just talking about um, what you're doing and, and your position in this, in this conversation and some of the work you're doing at CUNY? Sure. Um, I just moved to the Graduate Center at the City University of New York in July, and we're just now setting up our team here. And one of the things we're interested in is, one, reinvesting in public education, but two, the relevance to the trust challenge is as we think about all the different ways that we can learn online and on site, we're also having to pay attention to um, what is happening with our students' data. 
who is using that student's data? Uh, more and more universities have proprietary uh, systems for gathering enormous amounts of information. Um, who owns that data? Um, how careful are our learning institutions in managing that data? We can learn, um, I taught last year a MOOC um, through the Coursera platform, and they were learning about students' responses literally keystroke by keystroke. Um, that's an incredible amount of data, not only to know about content, but about how we pay attention, how long we pay attention, how we interact, and even the physiology of our bodies, and um, what is the best way to accommodate systems online. Some of that is very, very helpful and can help efficient, uh, systems be more efficient, more user-friendly, um, um, help us Take, help our affordances as human beings take more advantage of the affordances of the internet, and some can be extremely manipulative. Um, and so I think one of the things that brought me to my um, passion for this particular content uh, competition and the trust challenge is my awareness that as learning institutions, we have a responsibility that in some ways is a greater responsibility than Walmart, which of course messed up with trust and data, um, than uh, Chase Bank or Bank of America that have also had some security breaches, not just on the level of hackers, uh, which is this kind of security breach we all worry about, but even ethical issues. What kind of research are we doing with the data about, about our students? Um, how do we teach people digital literacies so that they become a little bit more aware of how they're sharing their own data and with whom? They're sharing their own data. Um, next year in the Futures Initiative, we're doing an incredible, next semester, an incredible project where the former um, president of the Graduate Center, and Bill Kelly, who was also last year's um, acting director of the entire CUNY system, all 500,000 full and part-time and lifelong learning students, and I are teaching a class called Mapping the Futures of Higher Education. We're teaching 15 doctoral students who are all teaching classes while while they're taking our classes. They're going to, we're going to be coming up with all kinds of innovations that they're going to be doing in their classes in the CUNY uh, colleges and community colleges. And then we're having a public website where some students who might be a freshman at Medgrevers Community College, La, La, La Guardia Community Colleges, College, Hunter College, Baruch College, one of the 24 colleges can give us feedback and actually have direct input that goes all the way up to the former president of the system. That's an incredible power that uh, an 18 year old or a returning student might have as in shaping the future of education. With that power also comes transmission of data and we have to be extremely careful and mindful that power and freedom and choice and openness and access, all of which are wonderful values in a democracy and in an educational system, also come with security, privacy, uh, anonymization, free from bullying, and all of those other things as well. So it'll be a wonderful opportunity to test the relationship between um, access and education and democracy and to ensure our responsible role um, as purveyors of trust in a, in a system. Thank you, Kathy. Jane, I would love to hear um, from you as well. I want to let everybody know that a lot of the, the questions uh, Jade has, has helped me and helped me understand this in a way I really have tipped my understanding over to think about trust in different ways. And, and I would love to hear from you, Jade, um, maybe in response to Kathy or, or comment a little bit about your involvement in the, the trust challenge and, and your thoughts. Um, I don't have a response to Kathy other than saying I'm really excited to see what Mapping the Futures produces. Um, but in terms of why I'm really, I'm excited about this competition, it's really wonderful to be a part of the team working with this. Um, one of the things that I've noticed as we've gone through the entire, like the launch of the competition till now, is when we talk about trust, especially in relation to learning, we tend to talk about the tacit trust we have when we think that people are getting educated or they're learning. We believe that the people they're being educated or learning from are people who should be teaching them. And one of the big shifts that we have to do just because of the technological changes is we have to reframe trust. And I think that's the beauty of the competition that it's trying to come up with ways to help us reframe trust, but it's also one of the difficulties and why it's a challenge and an opportunity. Um, I don't know what a perfect trust system looks like online. I don't know that any of us do, um, but we see gaps and I'm just really excited to be part of the conversation around that. 
Great, thank you. And and when Connie comes, we'll we'll make sure that she uh, she chimes in a little bit as well. Um, I, Kathy, I wanted to ask you um, specifically about the competition. You've been very involved in and in, um, shaping and being an architect as we think about this. The theme of the competition implies that there is already a current trust challenge, specifically when it comes to to connected learning. Can you share what you see as, as some of the major challenges to trust in connected learning, what those are right now? Sure. Um, if you look at any of the classical literature in the social sciences on trust, um, it's almost always about actors who know each other or who have recommendation or reference systems which ensure that the actors have some kind of um, at least uh, one generation removed reason to have a pact, some kind of a social compact with each other. What happens as soon as you go online is the network of people who can come incredibly close to each other, uh, communicate individually with each other, but who have no frame of reference in terms of who one another is, is huge. So the oldest joke of all about the internet is on the internet everyone's a dog. And you know the implication of that is we don't know who's on the other side. I can say I'm Kathy Davidson. Do you, you you know me now? You have it. We have a trust system here. So actually, you can all verify that I'm Kathy Davidson. If you get an email from me, or you get to see me on Twitter, or I somehow come into your social media network says Kathy Davidson, how do you know I'm really me? How do you know that I am the person I claim to be? So on the most simple level of the social science of trust, we suddenly have this new variable of immediacy and closeness of contact and impact in both a positive way and what could be a scary way. And we know this from religious connections that are being made, social connections that are being made, mercantile connections that are made on things like Craigslist, um, uh, sexual connections that are being made on hookup sites. Um, and learning connect connections that are being made all over the internet, as well as on systems like Yelp, where I go, I want to know what restaurant to go to, and I go on Yelp and I ask perfect strangers, which is the best restaurant in my neighborhood, and darned if I don't go into that restaurant and eat in that restaurant that night. I'm trusting people I have no reason, according to the long, long classical history of social science about what a stranger is and what a community is, no reason to trust these people, and I do. This is a huge social change we've all seen in astonishing ways since April 22nd, 1993, when the scientists at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications uh, released the Mosaic 1.0 browser to the public, and suddenly anyone with an internet connection had the ability to communicate anything they wanted to anyone else with an internet connection. Um, you know, the magnification of anonymous trust systems is enormous in everyday life. We do that all the time in our informal learning. We're learning now as educators to make an educational system that is geared to and sensitive to these opportunities and also challenges um, in the real world. And we're trying to prepare students through education for that. But then it, we have to ask, what are our own assumptions about trust within this system? And are we reliable trust makers? within this system of bonding. I taught 20,000 students last year in a MOOC on the history and future of higher education. I'm constantly running into people that say, hey, Prof. Davidson, I'm so sorry I had to drop your course. <laughs> it turns out they were in the MOOC. And <laughs> they feel like I'm their teacher. Um, you know, what is that? We don't even know what to call that system. There's nothing in the long, long history that goes back all the way to Plato, at least, and probably long before Plato, on the the philosophy and social science of human relations to have somebody feel guilty that they dropped a class in which there were 20,000 online students. You know, we're learning. We're having to learn this. And this is part of what the trust challenge is about, that we as educators, as learners, informally and formally, are learning this new way to trust one another. Well, one thing that you make me think of is that it, I, I think you really framed this as a, as a tremendous experiment. And, and there's a lot of us. I'm going to think of myself as a parent and, and the parents that I, I, I talk to, well, we don't even know we're in, in an experiment. We sort of think, I guess this is how it's going to go. Um, and Jade, I know you wear many hats in this same sort of conversation, this experiment that you're, you're, you teach, you're a student, and you're a parent of, of children in the school system. Do you, do you want to respond to what, what Kathy was saying? 
Um, I think, I also think thinking of it as a tremendous experiment is really important. And I honed in on the comment about knowing our own assumptions. Um, I think that's one of the things that is the hardest thing to do when we think about new forms of trust. We don't realize how many ingrained assumptions we have about who people are and what they're doing. And we tend not to know when those assumptions actually constitute risk or lack of access for someone. And risk and lack of access are something that we have to build in, and the way we build those in need to be in trustworthy ways, which is slightly different than trust, but very closely related. Um, just because, again, we have all of these cultural references of this is what education is, this is what learning is. I know these people. I send my student, my child to school, or I teach someone. Um, they're at the place where they're supposed to learn, but learning is happening all the time now. And so much of the learning is stuff that from the outside, just thinking 15 years ago, would have looked crazy. Um, and even the stuff that was popular in the beginning, like Second Life, um, that seemed crazy at the time, but it's already passe, and it's just happening in a very, very fast way. Um, so yeah, the, the risk of the experiment is something that I, I focus on a lot, just trying to make sure that I account for everything. Cheryl, one thing I do in my classes, and um, I've done this actually as an experiment with a middle school recently, is I will do things like have my students construct a user agreement uh, for the class, for example. Or uh, I'll bring in a product uh, like an iPhone. Um, they love it when I bring in the first, you know, I was part of the first generation of iPod experiments before it was even a two-way system, when it was just a music listening advice. I'll bring in this ancient ancient thing from 2003 and um, have my students pretend that they're invent they're releasing the iPod to the public and write a user agreement for it and then we look at the user agreement of a contemporary device like uh, um, iTunes and I'll, we'll do comparisons back and forth what did we include that we should have what did we forget to include what is this gobbledygook of language on this user agreement that no, everyone che checks, yes, I read it, and very few people actually read it. I also have my students write a class constitution, um, and Jade knows this, I think she was in one class where we wrote a constitution together, where the students actually decide what are going to be the rules of trust in this classroom. What will we accept? What won't we accept? What do we tolerate? What don't we tolerate? What do we invite? What do we discourage? How do, what are we missing? And that's my favorite question is, what are we missing? And I, as a teacher, can never figure out what we're missing. But sometimes if there's 30 of us in a classroom, together we can do a good job of, of, of crowdsourcing the idea of what we're missing. I also love to do deconstructive things where we'll take somebody else's constitution and we'll actually deconstruct and ask what each sentence means. And if we were translating it to our own situation, what would we need to do to make a, a human compact that allowed us to trust each other better? Um, all of those things we're actually creating rather than reading help us understand um, what might be called trust literacies or data literacies or digital literacies in a very, very different way. I, I think that, that what that makes me think of, Kathy, is um, the name of our, our competition is Trust Challenge, but it's really Trust Challenges. Uh, and it's different kinds of trust. And, and one of the things I know when I, when I think about those words together, it seems like a very daunting thing, but to go back to Jade's point about the assumptions, and you mentioned this as well, and this idea of it being an experiment, there's really no part of this that, that we should, no stone we should leave unturned when we're talking about this. So there's many ways to really approach these challenges, to talk about trust from all these different ways, just even in your one example. And it, and it made me wonder if, uh, this is a very difficult thing to do, but I, I'm curious if you you have, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this, do you, do you have a vision for what a trustworthy connected learning environment would even look like? Well, you know, I, what I find, I'm, I'm, I, we started Haystack in 2002, and we have very, anybody who registers to the site can write a blog. Anyone can become a leader. And we've had very, very few trolls in that whole time. Part of it is it's a referential situation. The students that are Haystack scholars have all been nominated by somebody else. Part of it is people do have to register for the site. But part is a real ethos of we want our community to thrive. And um, it's interesting to me how if somebody is being rude, often other people will say, hey, wait, you know, yeah, we can disagree with each other, but let's try to do so in a respectful way because this is a community of 
very, very young people. There's some people that have never been, not even young, new people to the Internet who've never blogged before, and other people who are famous pros who, you know, blog every minute on the Internet. And how you make um, conversations happen and trust happen across that kind of disparate culture is another, another trust element. Um, another issue, um, the, probably the one exception to that rule was when a very young student, a computer science student, um, who was taking a feminism class, asked in a very short blog, um, is there such a thing as a feminist programming language? And a men's group on Reddit um, found out about that and really started piling on, not just on the Haystack site, but worldwide, and attacking that concept. And it, um, you know, we were able not only to uh, intervene in that com conversation and apply a la label of t level of trust to make it a non-abusive situation, but actually were able to work with the young student who had posted that and say and help her to understand and frame what was happening. But that's an issue of trust that I think is extremely important. Who is allowed access and whose voice gets silenced by not the wisdom of crowds, but by the bludgeoning or the trolling of crowds. That's a kind of censorship that is also important for trust. It's not just about surveillance, it's also about um, a, a certain kind of respect, mutual respect that happens online. So your focus is very much on the, uh, the, the human systems, the way that we handle this technology so that that kind of trust is always intact. Dave, do you, do you have a, a vision for, for trust in connected learning environments? Um, yes. I think that one of the things that we often do with this, and it's one of the things that we're doing right now, and it's a natural thing to do, is we talk about trust on the interpersonal level, um, because it's easy to recognize human to human contact. We completely understand that, and one of the things that we have a really hard time with is thinking about human to technology contact and technology to technology contact. So one of the things that I like to consider um, when we think about trust is not just making sure that people understand the terms, but making sure um, people understand how they're interpolated into the technologies they're using. Um, what data is getting exchanged and where, how is that being held, how is that being protected, because even if this part is a big giant social experiment where we're playing with technology and seeing what can happen with connected learning, um, when somebody enters a position of learning, they're automatically entering a vulnerable place because they're saying there's something I don't know or there's something I want to explore and I'm not sure yet. And it seems trivial that that data might be out there somewhere, but for different people, again, this is part of the risk, there can be really big consequences to that. And because we often allow the technology to disappear and become invisible, and because we are so, we're human, we love talking about each other, um, we tend to sort of erase that aspect of trust. So for me, the ideal trust system um, would take the interpersonal relationships, the understanding of terms and the legal part, um, and then it would look at the ethics of the human technology and technology-technology relationships because those are just as important um, in controlling the modern trust systems as us being able to say, hey, let's come up with some rules together. I, I, I could not agree more, and um, I, I think that's one reason why I like in my classes to have my students actually build something so they can actually think about how, what those settings are and what, what, what kinds of systems um, actually uh, don't allow you to have certain kinds of trust relationships and which ones do and which ones, whether you like it or not, are, also, are already taking your data and using um, your data in ways that you may or may not be familiar with. So that's a great point, Kate. I really, really like, I think that's important. We just got a live question, so I'm going to skip over some some that I had um, ready to ask you because uh, this is a great question. Um, we have focused a lot in this conversation on trust for in individuals as they connect online, and, and the question is whether the trust challenge is also concerned with questions of which sources of information are trustworthy, things like uh, who produced this blog and who paid for this ad, and can I trust this Wikipedia entry? Yes. That's an easy one to answer. Yes, 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 yes. That's an incredibly good question. Because uh, reliability, again, if on the internet everyone's a dog, you also don't know who's information because it's valid information who's giving you information to order to prompt you to invest in something in one way or another that may or may not be reliable, honest, decent, true, fair, 
equitable, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I think that's extremely important. And there are reliability systems. Um, I've been reading a lot lately in a open source um, free software movement called um, the Debian community, D-E-B-I-A-N. And I highly recommend anyone go on to that community and look at their contracts and constitutions and communities and all of the ways that they're trying to make even their mistakes as visible as possible so that people who contribute to the community and use the Debian free software are also aware of who's contributing, why they're contributing, who's invested, what's reliable, what isn't reliable. It's a nice model to help you think about all of those issues. It's, it's such an important question. Thank you for um, asking that. And I also think part of the literacy we can already have um, is knowing that for a lot of the questions are the things that were positioned in the question like who produced the blog, who paid for this ad, or can I trust the Wikipedia page? Those answers are already out there if you know where to look. Um, for instance, if you go to any Wikipedia page, you can see the history of all of the edits to the page. You can see the conversations that the Wikipedia editors are having. Um, there's been countless articles on the fact that Wikipedia is mostly written by men, a very small population. Um, but we don't necessarily teach people to look at that information as much as we teach them to look at the end information because, again, we have all of these assumptions about how learning works um, that are sort of being flipped over. Um, we don't talk about flipped classrooms anymore, but I guess some people talk about cl flipped classrooms still. Um, but information has been flipped in a very interesting way. That means that it's crowdsourced, but that, that does change the questions we have to ask. But I promise most of the answers are already out there. It reminds me a lot of, of Howard Reingold's uh, crap detection tools, which would we annotate this and, and, and do some um, magic, Jade is going to do some magic to, to, to make this archive easy for people to flip through. Uh, I hope everybody will go take a look. He's got a great Google document and I will tell you, I felt so empowered looking at that because it, it, it gets to this idea that you can get behind the curtains and you can see who is pulling the levers and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great Great question, and it's a, a good part of the trust challenge. Thinking about trust in that ways, in that way, um, and and that leads me to the next question. It's actually a nice segue. Um, so, what is at stake? So, we've talked a little bit about what the vision is for some ways about how connected learning environments would look like, but but what's at stake if if we don't solve for this? Oh my God, the stakes are so high, and they're so high in every direction at once. In other words, uh, one stake is that um, we become more and more a tool of for-profit uh, corporations that are, you know, that see uh, the age group of, let's say, 12 to 25-year-olds are also the most assiduous consumers with the most um, non-spoken for money. I mean, you know, they're living, you know, you know, in a in the in a in a consumer society. Those that that's a target group. Um, it's why there's so much um, advertising for adolescents, uh, in terms of free spending money. Um, you know, we don't want to be just shills for consumers. Um, two, if we're really going to teach digital literacy, we have to model digital literacy. Three, if we're going to be investing taxpayer dollars or tuition dollars into Software systems, those software systems, and this goes back to Jade's point, need to be systems that we know are trustworthy and reliable and um, uh, are about learning, not about making money off learners. Uh, Jade, I bet you can go to the next 10 uh, different things, but I can't think of any. Is there anything as parents that we don't want more than to be able to trust learning systems into which we entrust our, our kids? I mean, I just don't think there's anything greater. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I was just thinking about this, and this is happening in a lot of schools where Google is making um, whole systems available to their, stu to their students. And as far as I can tell, their definition of trust is to remove the ads. Um, and in and, and creating these silos, these Google accounts um, for the kids also creates silos so that I, I'm not quite sure how I can connect with the work that he's doing and see what he's doing. So it does seem like we're fumbling a little bit to go back to that point about it being an experiment. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit about parents, but one thing that really strikes me when we have this conversation is that there's a lot of stakeholders that we don't normally think of when we when we talk about trust. One of the things that I, I loved about the Aspen Task Force report 
is that it really mentioned parents a lot. And in my conversation with Maria Teresa Kumar on Tuesday, uh, she was just saying the reason why so many people brought up parents is because so many people are parents and we're trying to figure out this new space. And so I, I want to ask both of you, um, it means, trust means different things depending on who you are uh, and in different contexts. And even in, whether you're a student, you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're an administrator, you're at a museum or a library or nonprofit or for-profit. And so when we think about trust in these different ways, trust is going to be different for all these different people. So if learners are at the center of a networked world, uh, what are the benefits that we hope to see when we put trust first? And who is the trust for first that we haven't seen yet? Jay, do you want to address that one? I can try. That's a big question. Um, I'm going to answer it with the previous question, too. Um, so in terms of what's at stake, um, especially in terms of like the broadest at stake thing, I think making a certain type of surveillance normalized is one of the biggest risks. And the questions about surveillance and privacy are probably the most universal. Um, even if we start thinking of it outside of a US context, that's something that people are worried about. Um, and it's interesting because surveillance has to be part of education. It has to be part of learning. If somebody is, you want to monitor their progress and see what they're doing. Um, but as a parent, the different ways that surveillance gets codified into systems is the thing that I worry about the most. Um, again, there's a risk in having this information tracked. Um, there's a risk in having the information tracked in a way that it can't be um, deleted, um, that it stays with the person forever, even if they're having a hard time. And while it's great to be able to track things over time and see how things are going, um, we don't question what we're trusting when we make these things the normal structure of learning. Oh, we have Connie. <laughs> oh, hi, hi, Connie. Connie. Hi, hi, Connie. Connie. Apologies. We're just, we're just having a very small conversation about a very small topic. Nothing, <laughs> nothing big. <laughs> we, we've been talking about trust. Kathy talked a little bit about the competition. Um, Dave, Dave has also been joining us. Uh, so we, we went ahead and we started, um, but I would love to backtrack a little bit and, and ask the question that I asked Kathy and have you chime in, um, and this is in terms of the theme of the trust challenge, it implies that there's a current trust challenge already, and, and, th and th this is already happening in connected learning, and we would love to hear you share what you see as some of the major challenges to trust in connected learning that, that inspired the competition. And for those who don't know, this is Connie Yell, who is joining us from the MacArthur Foundation, who is the um, fountainhead of this whole um, digital media and learning initiative. So thanks so much for being here, Connie. Thank you, Kathy, oh, for, for doing, doing my job there. <laughs> sorry, Connie. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, and it's my pleasure, and I'm, I'm so sorry that I, I'm late. I really apologize. If, if, I, if there's any way I, I could not, if I could have gotten out of what I, the meeting I was in, I would have. So I, I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, and it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, not quite sure where to dive in, but a, a couple of things come to mind, uh, which is to say, uh, in the connected learning and digital media and learning world, uh, there have been uh, so many issues uh, circling around related to trust that uh, make this competition uh, so vitally important for us and for being able to move the needle forward on connected learning and uh, DML and really advancing how we think about learning in the 21st century. And part of it is that we get so, I think, uh, we get in polarized conversations about safety and about privacy uh, without really shifting ourselves into that next level of conversation, which is what is what are what are we all responsible for, and what does it require from all of us in addition to what does it require from our technology platforms to enable uh, us to interact with each other, to share what we know, to share our knowledge and our data and our information in trusted ways. And so really what has uh, occasioned this competition 
uh, from MacArthur's perspective and, and is being so wonderfully done by Haystack is that there are times when uh, we're looking for new paradigms and looking to shift out of uh, old rhetoric and old conversations and need to have new ways of thinking and engaging in order to allow for new innovations to happen and new modes of learning to happen. And I think understanding trusted environments uh, and what it takes to collaborate to learn together in a trusted environment is one of those new paradigms. How we define it, how we design it, how we uh, relate and communicate within a trusted environment, I think is just so absolutely critical to learning for the for for going forward. And I would love to just add, I was just going to say that I was going to tell Connie that right before you joined, we were talking about surveillance and uh, learning and trust, and I think that fits so well with what you were saying. And I, I was recently in, in a conversation with my father, who's 87, who used to joke that when I was a, a, a bad kid, he would always say, it's going to be on your permanent record. And just remembering that term, permanent record, and what that meant when I was a kid versus what it means now, what it really is on your permanent record. If, yeah. you know, in business, we're always said kids should learn to fail. Well, now if you fail, it's on a permanent record that can have consequences in your life in a very serious way and with a longevity that most of us uh, wouldn't have even imagined before uh, connected, this connected internet world um, uh, existed. And trying to figure out what accountability is within a system where things can have that kind of permanence, I think is really, really um, a crucial factor. And it is a technological, I love the way you said design, um, yeah. as well as um, um, making collective decisions together. It's a social decision. It's also a technical decision. Maybe yeah. there are spaces where, in fact, we want to ensure the record is not permanent. And yeah. that part of connected learning is an experimental space where there is a um, tool built into the system that says this is not part of your permanent record. And in right. fact, you have freedom to fail here. Um, and it won't, it won't come back to haunt you. And that's yeah. something we rarely think about, but I think it's really important. I, um, Connie, I was just going to mention some of the, the highlights for me that had come up in the conversation so far. We were talking about um, assumptions, that there's so many assumptions, and also that there's really trust challenges, um, even though the, the competition is trust challenge, that, that we, were, we were talking about it. We're really in this grand experiment right now, and we're just trying to figure out the language as well as when we talk about trust, um, uh, there's so many different players in this. There's parents and educators, there's museums and libraries. Um, and, and there also is, this is sort of to the next question, this big question about equity when it comes to connected learning that we're, and Jay touched on this a little bit. Um, and I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about, about trust challenges and the relationship that has to equity when we're talking about um, building, building trust and connected learning and what that might look like. That's a, that's, that's just a, <laughs> that's a huge question. Um, and I'll even, the first place I'll start, uh, is there are a bunch of different inroads to, to talk about the equity question, but I want to cycle back to what Kathy was just talking about in terms of surveillance and what, uh, even on the trusted environment. So there's the, the technical social, um, Dana, Dana Boyd, I've learned a ton from Dana and from her research, and one of the things that Dana says so eloquently is uh, and when she's trying to, to make the point that we so quickly want to make it about the technology uh, as opposed to asking of ourselves what it means to have empathy and what it means to have understanding and what it means to uh, allow people, particularly youth and particularly youth of color, to make mistakes, and so, it, and she, and she, she says this so much more eloquently than than I ever can. But when you think about our last four presidents, um, one of whom sort of wrote about it in a book and said, "Get over it," the other one said, "I didn't inhale," the third one said he found God. Um, so they, these are all folks who come have in different ways been a, been privileged enough to say, "Forget my past." And we, we give them that license to do it. 
and yet when it comes to other kids, particularly low income kids, we say actually your past is going to haunt you forever. Exactly. And and we and then we turn to the technology to say, well, it's the technology's fault and and we should censor and and make the technology be designed differently. When in fact it's incumbent upon us to find forgiveness, to be understanding, to give people second chances and to not define them by by their past. And yeah. so at and, and we didn't uh, in the Aspen uh, task force report we really struggled with digital literacy and what it means to be digitally literate and we really struggled with social and emotional literacy and what it means I think it's so incumbent upon us uh, in the world that demands trust in a way that it's we probably never had such needs for trust because our failures are now so visible and our failures are so transparent and our failures are always going to be out there with us. It is in part an incredible gift and it's going to damn us forever. And so it requires a whole new kind of empathy and understanding. And the folks that it is going to penalize the most are low income folks of color who don't have the same kind of privileges and access to forgiveness by broader society. And that actually is a huge problem. And I think that's one of the things that we've got to start figuring out. And it's not something that that we often talk about uh, when we talk about uh, uh, some of the privacy issues and some of the surveillance issues. Uh, and and nobody talks about it more eloquently than Dana, I think. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't know if this is the same for Kathy and Jane, but I had not heard social emotional literacy until the, the challenge in the, in the Aspen Task Force. And I'm wondering if that is, it sounds, Kathy, when you first started talking, it sounded to me like that is actually very much a part of how you're approaching trust, is thinking of it as the human systems. The technology is, is sort of just, it's the device. The, the new way for this to, to work. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything in your classes that you're doing specifically around social and emotional literacies. Well, you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why my students create a class constitution is also to think about issues like equity and, ju and social justice and who is or is not represented in a, within uh, a constitution, who's inside and who's outside um, of that. So that's very, very, very much what I'm, um, I'm interested in. I also think, though, that um, we, and this is exactly what, what you're saying, Connie, we have a systems of accountability. It's almost like we're all forensic these days, and there's evidence, and that evidence yeah. comes in, in different ways against people who already are discounted by our society in ways that are different from people who have privilege within the society. And um, how you counterbalance for that, I think it's, a, it's systemic, it's social, it's cultural, it's about empathy, but it's also about um, maybe even a more act, uh, maybe an, even an activist mentality that um, injustices can be encrypted and, and magnified in quite amazing ways um, on the internet. We talked earlier, Connie, before you came about the, the bullying and the brutality and the hazing that goes on both in racist terms and in sexist terms. Uh, on the internet and how that is part of the element of trust and part of the social and emotional literacy that we have to inc incorporate in any trust challenge as well. Mm -hmm. the, the, so in addition to that, there are two other um, to slight, uh, very different uh, issues related to trust that are um, a little bit more technical that I want to raise that also connect to issues of equity and access. Um, and so part of what uh, I think is, is really critical uh, as, we, as we think of, of how we want to trust, create trusting environments for the sharing of data and the, the, the flow of our data, uh, right now that we, we still have a, a bit of a polarized conversation about, uh, that is very much a conversation about uh, why we don't want our data shared. Um, and sort of making sure that people have rights to their own data, which is apps I completely believe in and I think is absolutely right. At the same time, uh, I think it's incredibly important that we're really pushing hard on a conversation about how, why, and when uh, we want our data shared under, and in what contexts and how we know that the uh, uh, 
contexts are ones that in which we can trust. And from the learning perspective, it's absolutely critical that data be shared um, across different learning environments because we now more now more than ever, uh, learning is happening anywhere, anytime. And whether I'm learning in a library, whether I'm learning online, whether I'm learning in a school, we need that data to be connected so that our learning can be recommended to us, can follow us, and can opportunities can be opened up to us uh, in ways that they haven't been before. Uh, and networks related to our interests can be offered to us and we can become made aware of those. Uh, some of the badge work that we're doing, the cities of learning work that we're doing, um, are bringing those data sets together in ways that create new opportunities and awareness of pathways for learning to young people. And in many respects, those pathways and opportunities have always been there uh, and have been available to folks, particularly folks who are well resourced and who really understand how to use the technology. If we can figure out how to share our data in trusted ways, we can create quite transparent, openly available, uh, accessed pathways for young people, uh, regardless of privilege and regardless of access to um, those networks. And so if we keep shutting down uh, corridors for the sharing of data in the name of security and privacy, it turns out we're actually shutting down learning opportunities. And so we have to really be careful that in the name of privacy and security, we're also not cutting down opportunities for collaboration, for networking, and for learning. And so again, that's part of why this trust challenge is so incredibly important in, in MacArthur's eyes, is because we have to find ways to build trusted environments for the sharing of learning data that allows everyone to have access to all of the opportunities that are available that right now uh, only people who know how to uh, really are digitally savvy are getting access to. Um, and so that's just, I, 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 I can't say, uh, I can't overemphasize how important that's going to be now, but even more so in the future. Uh, and I fear that people are getting locked out of these learning opportunities without even knowing about it. I was at a meeting, um, this, this Karen, uh, is an example of what you're talking about, Connie. I was at a meeting maybe two weeks ago, where somebody was talking about a group of um, parents in New York that have um, voluntarily set up a Q&A system and a chat system where they can help other parents apply for, uh, with kids who are high need kids, apply for scholarships to colleges. And yeah. I thought that was fantastic. And that's an example of interoperable data that we need. And we have to be able yeah. to trust those systems because those systems of networking are built into our affluent school yep. system. And yep. this was low need, I mean, high need, low income parents that said, hey, we can network too. And that we're using available, what were they using? They were using Google. I mean, you know, they were using, you know, software that's available to them. So um, I agree completely that if we worry too much about surveillance, it's not going to be affluent people that are going to be hurt by that. It's going to be exactly yeah. the people who need access most. Yeah. We do have a real time question. This is a, a there are a lot of people who are listening who are getting ready to apply or have already started their drafts. Um, just to remind people that the deadline's on Monday. Um, and the question is, can the development grant funds be used to test the tech solution on focus groups, facilitate feedback sessions, and actually scale its usability once it's built, or can funds only be used to develop the tool? Kathy, do you yeah. want to answer that? I'll leave it to Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how the um, issue is framed, but uh, there's nothing, uh, Cheryl, you probably know the rules uh, on a technical level better than I do, but as I'm thinking through, I'm not thinking of anything in the rules that says that testing is not part of our, the possibility of the, of the um, competition. Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, we, we often have people who do research, so we have a lot of researchers involved. Um, I, I see no reason in fact, I don't think we've ever just had people build the tool. They almost always implement it, and um, and there's a lot of there's a feedback loop. So if I'm interpreting the question right, um, research is is we're we're cool with research for sure. <laughs> and in fact, I do, if, I'm, if I'm interpreting the question right, and I heard it just heard it for the first time, so I may be missing something. 
uh, building in a form of assessment is something that we very that's very much valued and uh, high value, high value in um, our competitions. In other words, there's some form of accountability built into the question. Is that what the questioner was asking? I, I, I may have missed that. I think it might be, um, and I, I hope whoever has asked the question, if, if you feel we haven't we haven't answered it, please please let us know. Um, I think that might have come through the, the webinar platform, but I, I think you, you've answered it. And I, I think um, yes, that yeah. do do the assessment, do do research, build the tool that that will. And and this goes back to what we were talking earlier is that we are on the the cusp of this wave where we're starting to understand how we're even talking about this and what, what this big experiment is and sort of figuring out what the boundaries are of this conversation. So yes, getting feedback from actual users is going to be incredibly valuable. Yeah. If anybody, I just want to say if anybody's on the fence about applying, I, this is such an important competition um, and because it, it is such an important issue uh, that we have to have, we have to have people experimenting. We don't want this. Uh, we don't want these issues legislated. We want people experimenting, trying new approaches, whether it's through programs or whether it's through uh, new approaches to technology. It, we really have to. We are trying to encourage as much experimentation as possible to really help push our notions of trust and to push beyond these. Uh, uh, sort of older, more traditional uh, approaches that we've had to issues of security and to, to privacy and uh, so that we can really be moving, uh, advancing our notions of uh, learning in, in trusted uh, environments and in, in trusted uh, programs. And I just can't say enough how important it is that people uh, really begin to think, join us in thinking about these issues and uh, join us even just in thinking through what they might want to apply uh, as a as a proposal for the competition because there's uh, you know even in just putting together a proposal you end up thinking new things and sort of pushing yourself or your team to new ideas and I just would really encourage folks to be in conversation about what they might put in as a proposal I, I, I just think this is one um, these issues are are some of the most daunting and most important challenges of the 21st century uh, for both how we think about learning, but more importantly, how we end up uh, sharing what we know with each other. And I think as with the badging competition, the people who actually are building these systems become models mm -hmm. for the rest of us to build on. Right. And um, you know, that the, um, the ex one experiment can then become a foundation of a whole new system that we're developing together. Yeah, that's absolutely that's ab that's absolutely been the case with the the badge challenge and Haystack is constantly putting out these challenges that are at the forefront and really leading and and helping us understand what it is we want our systems to look like going forward. But I hope that answered answered that question. Um, it, it does seem to me when when people have talked to me about the the challenge and are they're trying to understand the scope of it It does seem that anytime you're talking about data mm -hmm. And understanding it or how it moves or when it moves or who's seeing it or who owns it or anything that that is fair game for the challenge. Yeah Yeah, that's and, and there, there's yeah. no way to really confine that conversation because data is we just we don't even know in a lot of instances how it's moving. So it seems, um, I, I certainly hope, Connie, that people take your, your recommendation to heart and, and feel that if they can think of a way that they can respond to this issue about data and trust around data and, um, and the human systems around that, I hope people throw in and, and put something together. You have five days, people. 5 p.m. PST is the, is the closing time. So we, we have, have um, live questions. Pardon me. Do we have any other live questions from our people who are watching? Uh, we don't have any more live questions, but I was going to ask um, Kathy, Jade, or Connie, do you have any questions, or is there anything you would like to say in closing? We're we're coming up on the end of our webinar, so if anybody wants to have a throw at a, a talking point or uh, a memorable line, comment about um, the webinar conversation. I have a short one just in terms of experimentation and equity. Um, when I started my PhD program, the thing that was always said in the connected learning spheres that I circle in was that it's okay to fail. 
And I always found that very uncomfortable because not everybody is able to fail in the same way. Um, so I came up with my own saying, which is, it's not that it's okay to fail, but we have to have the space to try. So I'm really hoping that the people who are thinking about the competition aren't thinking about, will this be successful, but are instead thinking about, what can I try to do to make trust better? What can I do to make connected learning more equitable? How do I approach this in a way that will be meaningful and useful and scalable? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to add to that one. <laughs> and I just want to encourage uh, folks to uh, take these last five days before the competition closes uh, and, and give it their best shot. We would love and encourage uh, everyone to, to join us in the journey of thinking about this, uh, sort of wrapping your minds around it and joining us in putting some of your great ideas forward. Been incredible. And incredible apologies experience. again for being late. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a great conversation. I just want to remind everybody that there will be a full video recording of this webinar available on dmlcompetition.net under the webinars page, where you'll see archived webinars. Again, um, the trust, the, the building trust in connected learning environments webinars we did with Connected Learning Alliance are great. There's four hours of those, and then we also have a highlight reel. We also have, um, coming up, we will have the Cities of Learning and the Data Quality Campaign archive will go up, as well as our conversation with Maria Teresa Kumar from Voto Latino will go up, and this one as well. So we will have some for, for you to take a look at in the next couple of days. and um, and. Please keep the conversation going. We are going to be using the DML Trust hashtag throughout the year. Once once the or the competition moves forward, we're going to continue to use that. So continue having this conversation with us. We'll be doing a lot of things on Haystack and our Trust and Learning Group. And last but not, not least, I really encourage you to take a look at the Aspen Task Force report. I think they did a beautiful job. It's, it's so easy to, to flip around and look at the topics that are of most interest to you. And of course, thank you to all of our guests. Jade and Kathy and Connie, and thank you to everybody for listening. And we will, uh, I'm sure, see you again online. Take care, everyone. It's a great competition, trust me. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you.